Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this morning's worship. How good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. So let us praise the God who is great in strength and mighty in power and whose love will never let us go. Let us pray. God of all, we praise you for your care, for your commitment and compassion for all life. Your energy never runs out, your well of love never runs dry. Your grace never goes stale. Your word is always alive and fresh and life-giving. Thank you, God, our strength. Thank you, Jesus, our Saviour. Thank you, Holy Spirit, our Comforter. Amen. Let us pray. O Most High, we forget your goodness to us and turn our minds away from the marvels you have done. You called us in our mother's womb, consecrated us in your service, poured love and grace upon us, moved mountains for us and keep us as the apple of your eye. We thank you for your loving kindness seen throughout our lives, especially in difficult times when your love has held us, even without us knowing. Bless with your love all those who find life unbearable today, those living in fear of war and dictator those crowded in unsafe refugee camps, those working for peace yet being shouted down by warmongers, those waiting for life to end and fill us with the memory of your command to work for a better world. Risen Lord Jesus, we praise you for your life of loving service. Remind us of our call to resist the powers of evil that stalk our world. Our responsibility to tell the truth, whatever the cost, and the price of love involved in carrying our crosses. Bless with your love all those who are called to tell the truth this day. Whistleblowers calling out corruption in high office. Peacemakers exposing a lust for war. Journalists travelling, uh, journalists revealing threats to democracy. Most Holy Spirit, we praise you for your energy, for the energy you give the church ever surprising us and calling us to new forms of life and vitality, even sometimes when we least expect it. Make us always eager to proclaim the gospel through the word and through word and deed. Bless with your love those who proclaim your saving work this week those who donate to and volunteer in food banks, those who seek to make women's refuges safe and healing places, those who welcome folks into groups for addiction where step by step freedom is found. Eternal Trinity of Love, in our thanks and our prayers, we bring to you now those we love and worry about. Lord, thank you for your continued prote protection. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah 40, verses 21 to 31. Do you not know? 
Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they, th are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Our second reading comes from Mark chapter 1 verses 29 to 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began uh, began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone's looking for you, Jesus replied. Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Gazing at a painting by L.S. Lowry, I get the feeling that I am a huge giant standing by watching all these sick people hurry about their daily affairs. They all have their business to get on with, 
and are not at all aware of me looking over them. Even if they were ever informed of my existence, I am sure they would not stop and think about where I fitted in their lives for a second. The people Isaiah had been sent to, he'd been sent to talk to them, seemed to be just as isolated and living apart from their God, cut off from him almost, and outside his scope of influence. They're living in exile in Babylon, away from their homeland, Israel. They spend their daily lives influenced by a, pa by a foreign power with different customs and ways of living. They live among people who have no connection with their God. They live difficult lives and feel that God has abandoned them in this strange land. My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God, they complain. It is as if God is observing them from a great distance and they're going about their, their daily business day by day, just like those matchstick people in the paintings by Lowry. God is looking on and appears not to be involved in their lives. They feel alone, abandoned, totally unaware that God shows any interest in them at all, particularly when things are going wrong for them in their lives. As a nation, they complained to God because they had heard tell of the great care God once had and once showed them as he led them out of slavery in Egypt and accompanied them as a people guiding them into the promised land. Today, we're not living in exile like the people in Isaiah is talking to, yet there may be times in our own lives and situations when we feel alone and apart from God's gaze. Things happen to us and around us as we begin to feel down in spirit. We do not know how we're going to climb out of the hole we find ourselves in. It's easy to plod on day after day and end up being weary and losing hope of any change coming about. It's a vicious circle. When you get weary and lose hope, then you may not have enough strength to fight on through, and you may even lose your trust in God that God will be there for you. Isaiah tells his people that God has been with them all along. He really is interested in what they're doing in their daily lives. He is there for them in their down moments of life. Nothing in their lives is hidden from him as he sees everything going on in their daily existence. Yes, they're still living in exile, but it will not be forever. And even in their exile, they will be able to turn to him in their moment of need and he will come close to them and show his care for them. One of the first steps in coming to acknowledge that God is there for you and will be readily get involved in your life, guiding you in the tricky bits and answering prayer, is to believe that he is able and willing to get involved. Isaiah mentions that God is greater than we are, so he's not limited in the same ways we experience. He mentions that God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. This reminds me of observing that L.S. Lowry painting of matchstick people. God is bigger than us. His ways and his thoughts are greater, greater than we can imagine. Yet he remains connected to us and is interested in what we're doing day by day. Not only is he greater than us, he's also more powerful than us. What we know we cannot do, he can. He has authority over the elements of the universe. His word has power to bring into being and to make whole, to change things for the better. He reduces the rulers of this world to nothing, Isaiah reminds us. They are raised up and brought down. We can understand this and perhaps a smile spreads across our faces as we think of the politicians over the last few years who have grieved us. We're told that in our Milky Way alone, it's estimated that there are about 100 billion stars. And in the universe, NASA tells us that astronomers consider there are about one septillion stars out there. If we're not sure exactly how big that number is, a septillion is one followed by 24 zeros. Isaiah reminds us that the starry host is subject to God's designs. He has power over them all. 
as well as wanting to get involved in our lives and desiring to be in a relationship with his people, God is beyond time. He is eternal. Isaiah reminds us, the Lord is everlasting God. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. God is always on our case if we so desire him to be. He is never too tired or weary to bother with us, and he desires us to be the best people we can possibly be in our circumstances. Isaiah tells us of his willingness to bring strength to the weary and increase the power of the weak. What the people in exile need to do is to acknowledge God in their lives and look to him once again. They need to wait for him to act, to rest in his presence to renew their hope in the future he's going to bring them and to trust in their God once more. This is the nature of the God in whom we have put our trust. We see the same nature made plain to us and demonstrated in acts of power as we hear about what the first steps in Jesus' ministry were. We hear Jesus preach, preaching the coming of the kingdom of God in people's lives. But we also see the reality of the love of God made manifest in those who were ill or suffering in body or spirit. It all began in the home of Simon and Andrew, two of the first disciples whom Jesus chose. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, we hear, and Jesus healed her. Word must have got out because as the Sabbath came to an end, we're told that the whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. Jesus shunned celebrity and went off early the next day to a quiet place where there were no people so he could pray. His mission was to proclaim the kingdom of God and so they moved on to the other villages throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Jesus had come to tell the, the people that God loved them and to demonstrate the love and the presence of God in person. In seeing him, they were seeing God. In hearing what he taught, they were hearing the word of God firsthand. And in experiencing the healing hand of the Lord, they would know beyond all doubt that God had not forgotten about them. God was not passively looking on from a distance, but was actively engaged and interested in every aspect of their lives. He was with them in their midst. People come into the presence of the Lord at any time of the day, any day of the week knowing that he cares about what each one is going through. When we read of his involvement in the concerns of other people down the ages, we give him confidence in his authority and power over the natural forces in the world. We're given hope because we know that he is active in our everyday life and is very much involved with what we are experiencing and feeling. His greatest desire is for us to be whole in body, mind and spirit. What Isaiah declares to the people who are tired and weary as they live in exile is for us now. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let us hope in the Lord too and wait for him to restore our lives in the world today. Let us pray. Ever loving God, you sent Jesus to bring healing to the sick and the sad and to show us your love by seeking out those in need. Send us, we pray, to be your eyes, your feet and your hands, seeing, seeking and loving those in need. Amen. <laughs>
let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Uh